Sahaja Yoga is such a fantastic thing that when people get their realization, they can't even believe that they have got it, first of all. The other day I had a minister from one of the countries and his wife, and he's suffering from some mental trouble. And when we raised his Kundalini, he started feeling a tremendous cool breeze in the hand and cool breeze coming out of his head. He just couldn't believe his eyes. He couldn't believe it. He said, what's all this? I said, how are you feeling? He said, I'm so relaxed that I can't think of anything, just I can't think. I've never been like this, this is a new thing that has happened to me. Now, we have to understand also, logically, certain things about Sahaja This I'm explaining for people. Those who will be now going out and speaking about Sahaja Yoga to other people, and how to deal with people who are intellectuals, it's important to understand. What are the hurdles they have uh, by which they do not want to receive the message of Sahaja and what are the barriers that really create a problem for them before and after? Now we'll deal with people who are Western uh, people, we can say. They can be also Indians, they can be Asians, they can be anybody, but who are more of a Western mind than of the Eastern mind. So the first thing that we'll confront is that we'll have a mixture of people who will come to. There will be people who will be seekers, ardent seekers, and there will be people who have been hurt and mesmerized by some gurus or something, some sort of a spiritualist and this and that. You will get fanatics also who might be seekers themselves. And there could be some people who could be absolutely fake also because it's a fashion these days. In a party you go, I mean, I, I live with people who are supposed to be very elite and mix up with them. And whenever they talk, uh, I find they talk of seeking. Surprising, you see, they'll be taking wines and alcohols, this and that, and uh, uh, it comes to politics, then they will say, that, oh, but there has to be some sort of a self-realization about it. Or uh, they will say, we have to understand it uh, rather deeply from a divine point of view, or some sort of a thing they will hint at. So they are thinking of uh, some breakthrough that has to take place. I mean, it is coming to them, maybe through their unconscious, maybe their, through their logic. They are arriving at a conclusion that something has to happen and we are still confused because we haven't found the absolute. But despite that, among them, I find, as it is the topic of the day, sort of thing among people, is, luckily it is the topic. Any, I mean, even if it, they talk of economics, it comes to that. Then. Among them, how many of them are really the seekers or they are just doing it because everybody is talking of fashions and things? Like, uh, you see, I've never been to a race course, for example, and then everybody is talking about race course, so you feel so out of place and backward. You look so <laughs> backward in that society. So you just go and read something about it and discuss with others and say, oh, all right. Uh, this I know, I know one jockey, I know this, that, just to impress others. That also kind of people are existing. Of course, these people live day to day, they are not going to come to Sahaja so easily. Uh, they live on day, day to day basis, you see. Today we had this party, went to that party, came out and enjoyed this, met this gentleman, I know this man, that man, all sorts of things goes on and I think they finish their life in this day-to-day -day basis wages that they get out of life, they finish. They don't think of the beyond, they don't think that there's something else more to their lives, and that thinking is not there, but just as a fashion they may talk about these things. 
Of course, among them there are seekers, no doubt. Them also there are seekers. But seekers are mostly not very successful people because they do not find success so alluring, so tempting, so magnetic. To them, this it's quite vivid and quite clear-cut that those who are supposed to be very successful in life, in any field, say in money matters or say in politics or anywhere, they find that they are rather eccentric. If not eccentric, they are uh, a bit dominating. Or sometimes they find that uh, they are very ambitious and that they little bit try to put down others by their eminence or whatever success they have got. So all these things come into the mind of a seeker who, who doesn't try much for his material success or doesn't talk much for his also intellectual success. He may read a lot just to find out what is the truth. That's a different sort of a seeker. That's, that's not material seeking, but that's what so many Sahaja Yogis who have been here have done also that they have read too much. So you confront such people, a mixture of such people together. But you have to be prepared for every time because God has made this world with very care but lots of variation, permutations and combinations are there. As I told you last time, there are three permutations and combinations. The first is the power of desire which is on the left hand side. Second is the power of action or willpower, you can say, which is on the right hand side and the central one is the evolutionary one, third one. So we have these powers and these three create three moods. The first one is called as Tamoguna, right one is Rajoguna and the middle one as the Sattvaguna. So the combinations and permutations of these three gunas create different human beings. And accordingly, their, uh, their styles are and their seekings are. And accordingly, they fall a trap, trap to people who try to seduce them. Now the people on the left-hand side are more addicted to habits. Like if they take to alcohol, they'll become alcoholics. If they take to smoking, they'll become chimneys. <laughs> Uh, a sort of thing. You know, they go to the extremes, the left, and they, uh, their willpower, which is the right side, goes on. The will, she starts going down very much. And they cannot overpower their desires, their these habits. The habits become desires. See. Then to add to that also, when they see that by doing action people have brought forth wars, this is super intellectual way of looking at life is. Then what have we done? We have created atom bomb by thinking, we have killed so many people, we have done this, we have done that, all wrong things we have done by taking action. So it's better to go into inaction, absolutely inaction. So when they think of these things and why this materialistic world, this all this creation and all that we have done, because of that we have aggressed other countries, so better go into inaction. Such people become prone to the left hand side more then they take to drugs and things. And also alcohol goes hand in hand with too much use of willpower because if you use too much of willpower, you get so frightened of your ego and your action that you want to relax onto the left hand side. Now the habit formation takes place maybe from very childhood and then the willpower is diminishing gradually when that habit becomes sort of a part and parcel of your being. Like, you see, in the Western modern society, uh, to flirt is a habit. Flirting is definitely a habit. It's not a question of, uh, it's, a, uh, it's not an innate need of a person. It is just a habit that is formed. And in a society, when it is accepted that, uh, oh, it's nice to impress men and uh, nice to impress women, it becomes a sort of a pastime for many people. And so even uh, when they are grown up, they cannot get rid of it. Even if they are old, up to the grave time, they go about with it, you see. They just can't get out of it because it becomes such a habit, an obsession, and the society also supports it, you see. So the whole thing starts becoming a habit and you become so weak with it. 
that uh, you just cannot do it with your willpower, even if you try, or you justify it, oh, I enjoy it. Like a lady who had cancer, I was treating her, and I said, you may have to give up your alcohol. She said, but I like my sherry at least. I said, no, what to do? She, she likes me, so everything is justified. I enjoy my whiskey, she said. I said, then what am I to do? I mean, you'll, she'll have to enjoy her cancer also. But the, we enjoy the, the, uh, the thing that brings you disease, but not the disease. And if we understand it clearly, that these habits give us problems which are most agonizing, most troublesome, they give you such bad effects in later lives that uh, you rather have no habits and enjoy your life than to have these so-called enjoyable habits. Now people might say, what happens with flirting? You might say. It's a very simple question, you see. You'll be surprised those people who flirt too much lose their memory very fast. Your memory will be lost. Because your attention is moving all the time, your eyes are moving, you know the Swadhisthana chakra works so much, your memory will be very weak. Apart from that, your attention will be very weak too, your concentration will be very weak, and you will age very fast. Because when you are using your eyes for a habit, your eyes for the habit, imagine, nobody could think or think of that. But Christ must have seen it, that's why He said, you should, thou shalt not have adulterous eyes. He must have seen that part. So when you start using your eyes, you see, for something that is desire, to that extent, I mean, I don't know if it's any desire fulfilled or not, because I don't know what it gives you or gives anyone, it's not easy to understand. But whatever it is, if it is used for a purpose which it is not going to fail, for example, supposing I use this glass for something like making a light out of it or something, it will break. It is not supposed to do that. So if you start using something for a purpose for which it is not meant, your attention can become very weak because your eyes are meant to see. And after your realization, your eyes are to witness. They give you the witness state. You do not, when after realization with your eyes, you just witness, a complete witnessing. Like now, I witness you people. Just I'm witnessing, nothing. I don't want anything from you, only I'm witnessing as you are, all of you. And what I'm witnessing is the beauty that you have, is what you are created as. I'm just seeing that, and the complete joy that is you, which the Creator had in creating you, is absolutely one with me. I'm just witnessing that, seeing you, nothing more or nothing less. Now when, supposing I use my eyes for looking at a person with the idea of possessing it, possessing a person, which I cannot. I cannot possess anything you know. I mean, for all, for all rational people must understand, you cannot possess anything. I want to possess a person. And you look at a person with the idea of possessing. By looking at a person, I don't know how you can possess, when even binding a person you cannot possess. When you die, you have to leave everyone here. So this kind of a game, when it goes on, your attention becomes very, very low. And I've seen people have such horrible memories that one person rang me up, talked to me for half an hour and asked me, what should I do for the memory? So I said, all right, you put your right side on the left-hand side, try to control it, do this and do that. He lost his memory not because of that, but because of Hatha Yoga that he did. <laughs> I mean, 
There are so many ways by which you can really lose your memory, but one of them is definitely this. So I told him, you put your right to the left all the time and try to balance it. When we put right to the left, what we do, we put our willpower on our habits. So again he rang me up, you see. So I asked, somebody was there, I said, now please, I talked to him for half an hour, I'm really tired. Will you ask him, what is it, what did he, does he want? So he said, no, I, because I forgot everything what your Mataji told me. <laughs> I said, again, half an hour more? <laughs> I said, next time you put a tape recorder, when I talk to you, it will be a better idea. <laughs> so this is what happens. And at a very early age also, people can start. One of the reasons I'm saying, it doesn't mean that everybody who loses memory loses because of this. But one of the most important thing is that to keep yourself normal, try to avoid any habits that are forming by denying something. It's the best way. There's a very good poet, a uh, very well-known poet in India, who's written a nice couplet which I liked. He says that whatever this heart wants to see, you better not see. You see, better deny it. Because if it does again and again, that means there's some sort of a spirit or some sort of a nonsense that is pulling you up. So any habit, any habit or any addiction, say you are addicted to anything, supposing you are addicted, say, to a piece of jewelry you have, never wear it. Still you feel like wearing it too much, donate it, give it to somebody. Because there's nothing so important than yourself. But you'll be surprised when you start denying it, playing with your mind, playing with your desires. Whatever you want to have, you said, all right, we'll have it, and just don't have it. For example, you are going to a restaurant, you want to eat something, I don't know what you people like, but say you want to eat something special anything, I don't know the name so much. There you go and you just end up with a bread, finished. You have to play with yourself after realization. And it breaks then the link of that addiction. That is one of the very subtle conditions we have within ourselves. So today, as I am talking to you about the seekers who come to you, they have habits. They have habits. Say, we had six people who were drug addicts. I used to call them druggists and chemists. First they could not even see me. They said, they just see light coming out of me because their agya was spoiled, so they couldn't see anything and all sorts of things happened with them. Then some of them felt that their body is going out of their body. Mm, uh, the soul is coming out and the body is left there, they are seeing me from there and all sorts of things, all experiences they have had with all kinds of drugs they had taken. You see, they had taken the left-sided, the right-sided, or everything they had tried. Now to talk about drug was really blasphemous. I just couldn't talk to them in the beginning. If I had said anything, they would have really shut me out. So you never, the person who has to tell them should never directly come on that point that don't take drugs. That one thing one has to remember, that when such people approach you, you should never start talking against that. I mean, you will be boxed for nothing at all and all Sahaja Yoga will go down. So for a druggist, supposing he comes to you, what should we do? What should we do to him? You see? So we should start talking like this, that I was also a druggist, even if you are not. You may say that, there is no harm in telling them, because if you that way, you smooth the way. There's no harm in telling uh, little lies just to bring them up to the truth. So you have to stoop down so to say that I was a druggist or you can say my father was a druggist or somebody nearest to you uh, <laughs> whom you know, so that they do not get angry with you, see. Because they are seekers. The trouble is they are seekers. These habits have come to them because they were seeking and they went deep down into that seeking. In that seeking they took to drugs and that's how they become drug addicts. So now they're not normal people and if you 
just talk to them in a normal way as you would talk to a normal person, you can never save them. Now you are here out to save them. So the best thing is to talk to them in such a manner that they try to understand you. First you identify yourself with them, you stoop down to their style of life and then talk to them. That's a very good way of really bringing them nearer you and a very compassionate way of approaching. Or you can say a mother has to give the cast oil, then she gives it in a chocolate. So approach that. You'll be amazed, you can overcome their habits. Because Kundalini, when she rises, she herself corrects them. They start feeling terrible pain and left side and then they feel comes completely this uh, left side, no vibrations coming out and all sorts of things they feel and they start understanding it. So Kundalini herself goes and clears them out, makes them happy so that they do not take to these things. Because a person when he's bored, when he has more time to think about other things, he takes to these things. So there is no time because you become timeless, you go beyond time with realization. That's how you can overcome the left side. Also you can raise your right side and put it to the left side by raising the right side is you are raising your willpower and go to them. But if you tell somebody uh, who is a drunkard, you must have your willpower, you must have your willpower. He said, yes, yes, I promise, I promise, I promise. Next day he comes, uh, how are you? Then again finished. All promises are broken in five minutes as soon as he sees a bottle. That means all these promises are not supported by his willpower. So no use taking promises from him. Instead of that, try to raise his right side. If you raise his right side and put it to the left side, so the willpower takes over and can help that person to overpower his desire because he is a seeker and he deserves all that attention, all that care, all that minute method of helping him out even if he does not get realization. You know so many people who have been alcoholics have been completely cured by surgery. So f for all such people you have to have patience and no anger for them at all. Because they themselves are in a pitiable state. So imagine of a person who is an alcoholic on the street. Just think of such a person who is just on the street thrown by all his people outside. With these people if you try to be harsh with them they will never give up. But do not sympathize with them. That whatever you are doing all right, all right, go ahead with it. But in your own Sahaja Yoga method, if you can raise the right to the left, the superego goes down and the ego comes up. When it comes to the center, raise the Kundalini and the Kundalini will come up and I'm sure he can overcome that. But for this you have to have patience, you have to do it again and again. Now this we have been confronting many times. But the whole approach should be of tremendous patience, as I said, of tremendous concern about that. These people have gone to that extreme also because peop nobody has any concern. After a certain limit, people just give them up. That's how they have lost. Now the people who are from lunatic asylum, say, for example, we get people directly from lunatic asylum, certified mad, imagine, to our programs we get. Now what do we do with these mad people? We can get angry and ask them to get out. But they are serious. This is your duty to see that they get realization. It's very important that they should get realization, they should not be lost. It's very simple to cure them, is to put their willpower over their desires or over their left side. It's the left side drag that has taken them to this lunatic state. Maybe a person who is emotionally very disturbed from childhood, he has the left side problem like he had no mother or the mother was very severe or had stepmother and all the left side problems as you understand are there or he has had a very bad time with his wife, or he had emotional problems, he suffered a lot. All such people, you see, sort of resign in life and become that kind. And they, they become mad. When they cannot bear it more, they become mad because it's an escape. It's, it's an arrangement made by nature itself so that you do not face it. When you are mad, you don't know what's happening, you are not aware of it. Imagine to be mad and to be aware, what a problem it will be. That's why nature does for them and our only duty is to raise their right side and put it to the left side and raise their Kundalini.